There are two main levers when it comes to getting a better handle on your money. There is, of course, cutting expenses. We talk all about cutting expenses, how to do that. But the other, which we talk less about, is increasing income. So if you can take expenses down and take income up, you can hopefully increase your surplus in order to pay down debt, save for retirement, save for travel, um, invest more money, all those sorts of things. So how do you go about improving your income? Well, it comes back to you know, questions of being effective in your job and continuing to pursue roles that um, you know may allow you to increase your income over the course of time. Taylor Urquhart is the head of the Indeed Job Squad in Canada, and he joins us now to talk a bit more about career coaching. Hello there. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I, I love that phrase, the Job Squad. It's like there's is there like a one eight hundred number that I can call and get the Indeed Job Squad to come to my house and I don't know make me more handsome for my next Zoom job interview. What what is exactly involved for the job squad? Uh, so the job squad uh, partners with our uh, ESG or environmental social governance uh, group. And essentially we partner with a lot of community organizations to help job seekers who are facing barriers uh, find their next role. Um, so essentially anyone who might have a non-traditional challenge and uh, being able to land their next job and needs a little bit of uh, guidance as to next steps, uh, we try and partner with those organizations to be able to create some more synergies for them. Mm. And, you know, the phrase that people may well have heard about is uh, a career coach. When you think about career coaching, how would you um, identify what that actually means? What are they coaching a human in? Essentially identifying their own strengths and talents and really making sure they're able to market themselves in the best way possible. Uh, a lot of what people do when they're applying for their next job um, is when you're interviewing, you're essentially selling yourself. Uh, and for a lot of people, it's a it's a new concept. And sometimes a little bit of guidance can be needed uh, to be able to tailor their resume and make sure that all of the great skills and assets that they possess are being uh, portrayed in the best light possible. These days, there are services such as Indeed that make it both way simpler to apply for jobs, it feels like you'd do it in one click, and also uh, it seems like it's harder to get the job because suddenly now there's like a thousand applicants where before when there was a lot of work to do, uh, the pool might be a, a little smaller. Tell us more about the latest and greatest on resumes. What are people, is it longer, is it shorter, is it what are some things that people should think about when it comes to developing the most effective resumes? I think one of the most important things to consider when you're crafting a resume um, is being succinct uh, while also being detailed enough that you capture the attention of whoever it is who's scanning through and reading that resume. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give people is when you're applying for a particular kind of job, you almost feel like you have deja vu. Um, reading through all these job descriptions, you find a lot of similarities for the same title um, or the same kind of role. And those are things that you really want to focus on in your own resume. That that kind of the meat of the resume, that 75% that you see repeated in each job description, you want to make sure that you're encapsulating that in your own skill set and your own performance and the way that you are showcasing yourself so that whether it's the recruiter or the HR manager or whoever it is who's scanning through your resume sees those similarities as well and hopefully moves you into a phone screen or into a, like in the next step of the interview process. That resume is a key part of the tool to build this sort of narrative for your candidacy. I'm a journalist by background. Facts really matter to me. What caution would you provide to job applicants in terms of just how flowery they might become in uh, telling the narrative about their work history? I think it's really important to not oversell yourself because uh, it's probably only going to come back to, to bite you in the end. Um, I think that it's really important that you articulate correctly the skills that you have and your level of competency with those skills, um, because eventually it will come out, um, you know, how uh, successful you are at a particular task or what your true skill set is. Um, and the best thing you can do is make sure that you're aligning that um, and setting the right expectation right out of the gate. So you, your resume was sufficient to get you that first interview. Awesome, fantastic. 
how do you coach people to prepare for that um, that first interview? What are the key things they need to do to prep? I think one of the big things is to research the employer. Uh, employers love when you know a little bit about them. Um, you may have applied to quite a number of jobs. Uh, however, when you're in an interview with that particular employer, uh, it's important that you can pull out some little facts or tidbits about that company, why you want to work there, perhaps why their you know unique mission really speaks to you. Um, if they've been involved in any sort of community work that you're also passionate about, I also think that's something fantastic to be able to bring up because that's really going to help differentiate you from some other candidates who are just showing up to the interview, not necessarily knowing anything about the role itself, um, the company, uh, or even the hiring manager. Mm -hmm. So doing a little bit of homework beforehand, um, using something like Indeed's company pages, where you can read reviews, find information about, you know, what the employer is doing in the community, um, the kind of roles that they're hiring for, uh, what people think of the CEO and the management there, uh, you can relay all of that information back uh, in your interview and really stand out as a top candidate. One of the big categories of questions uh, are behavioral questions. So give me an example of a time when you demonstrated leadership, those kinds of things, usually said in an accent like that, I'm sure. Uh, how does one prepare for those types of questions, knowing that there's not like 80,000 of those? There's, I don't know, there's maybe 10 you need to prepare for at max. I think when you're talking about behavioral questions, try and think a step ahead if you can uh, to make your answer a little bit more cohesive. Think about perhaps the why that they're asking you this question and how it could potentially relate to the job or perhaps to other experiences that you already possess or ways that you've navigated um, different aspects of your career, whether that's a challenge, whether that's a success that you've had, uh, and kind of try and craft a narrative to be able to, to link those two together. Um, that shows a bit of foresight and also shows how you're able to highlight your skills and bring them back to a wide variety of different behavioral things. Mm. Uh, the best piece of advice I got there was was years ago, the car model context action result. And I was told to like, put it on a piece of paper in advance. Do you have recommend people bring paper to job interviews? I mean, so many are on Zoom, they wouldn't have any idea if you had a piece of paper in front of you. I think my one hesitation with someone bringing paper is it's really easy for a lot of people to kind of keep their head down and look like they're reading a pre like a canned response, essentially. Uh, yeah. And that's never ideal. Uh, employers want to get to know you. They want to see the true version of yourself, um, not a perfectly edited version. Um, and you never necessarily know what question they're going to ask. And I find that people often stumble to be able to adapt, let's say, what they wrote on paper um, and weave in some new concepts that naturally came up. Up through the interview process. So it can leave the employer feeling that perhaps you're a bit rigid uh, right. and that you need a lot of prep time. And it's better to think on your feet if you can. Situational questions are is another like broad category of questions. How do you prepare for those? I have always found that to be uh, probably the most stressful part of a job interview. I think it kind of ties back to some of the things I was talking about with the behavioral example as well, um, but really taking into account, you know, perhaps the why behind it, like, what's the real reason that you think the employer is asking this? Is this something that comes up frequently in this job? Are they looking for someone who has, you know, experience with dealing with conflict, as an example, um, or someone who has, you know, perhaps a lot of experience in being able to close a sale quickly and effectively, uh, whatever it might be. And really using the examples that you can think of, ideally from some of your more recent, either the most current role or the role before that, um, being able to show some continuity uh, between the work that you've done and the work that you're hoping to do at this new employer um, goes a long way. I'm on the hiring side a lot. We think a lot about um, the questions we ask. Uh, and then we open the floor to the candidate to find out what they want to ask from us. I don't know if we've ever hired someone who wasn't ready with some really interesting and insightful questions. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure why that's such an important thing, but it is for us. Maybe it goes back to your research point earlier. What sort of questions should a candidate prepare when the baton is passed? And they say, what do you want to know? What do you want to know from us? I think it's really good for anything that came up in the interview that perhaps isn't necessarily premeditated that you can weave in there. Um, I think that shows uh, a lot of proactivity and how you're thinking about the role and how that relates to the questions that you were asked in the interview process. Um, I also think 
questions around uh, the research that you've done, if there's something that came up that, um, you know, sat really well with you or that you were really thrilled to find out about the employer, um, asking more information about that, um, asking whether it's the recruiter or the hiring manager, you know, what they love about their job and what makes this workplace unique and, you know, you know why you should work there yourself um, is always great as well. Um, as a job seeker, um, you have a lot of um, opportunity available to you. Uh, and the market, especially now, has shifted a little bit in terms of people are being more particular about where they choose to apply uh, and they want to find out more details about the employer. So interviews are not a one way street. Um, it has to be a mutually agreeable uh, contract, essentially, for you to start working there. It's supposed to be beneficial for both parties. Uh, and this is your real opportunity to to be able to ask any burning questions that that you may have about that particular employer. Let's say you feel like, yes, I hit it out of the park. I did everything I had hoped to do in that interview. Uh, what should a job seeker do afterwards? Do you send a cake? Do you send flowers? Do you send a pizza? Do you send a handwritten note? What's best practice these days? I really do think that it's great to follow up, especially after a few days thanking whether it's your interviewer uh, or whoever the hiring manager is that you're, you you chatted with, um, thanking them for their time, um, some of the things that came up in the interview that you were very excited about. Uh, it's always nice to kind of close the loop and ask for like next steps. Uh, I think it shows a level of proactivity. Um, but I also think it's really important to uh, give a little bit of time. I wouldn't send it out like a second after the, the interview has completed. Um, give them, let's say, 48 hours um, to kind of sit, think about it, compare you to some of the other candidates. Uh, and then it's a nice little reminder uh, about the interview that you had and bringing yourself back up to the forefront after that. Really helpful stuff. Taylor, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Taylor Urquhart is the head of the Indeed Job Squad in Canada, and he was here to talk a bit about some of the things you might want to keep in mind if you're uh, on the verge of a job search yourself.